Hello and thank you to the organisers of this Centre for Accounting Research and Education Conference in collaboration with the Sustainable Investment Forum. My name is Dr Robert Charnock. I received my PhD from the London School of Economics and Political Science, focused really on carbon accounting and climate finance. So I've been in this space a little too long, some might say. Um, I received that PhD while working on a United Nations and Greenhouse Gas Protocol project looking to develop a new carbon accounting standard for scope three emissions for the financial sector. Uh, but more relevant to today, I am currently co-investigator in the UK on a financial reporting council project, looking at the use of climate scenario analysis by FTSE 350 companies. Climate scenario analysis has become of increasing interest recently due in part to the recommendations of the task force on climate related financial disclosures. And that's what I want to focus today's spotlight on because really the core element of this spotlight is I want to focus on a fundamental challenge in climate finance. And that fundamental challenge is how to link long-term targets on climate change to what we're doing today. So we have the targets in the Paris Agreement of limiting warming to two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels and pursuing efforts to limit it to 1.5 degrees Celsius as well. But the point is action to achieve those targets need to happen today. But bridging that temporal divide between these long-term targets and between action today is we have to establish a new bridge. And fundamental to establishing that temporal bridge are the practices of accounting and also of risk management. So as a quick disclaimer, I'm not here speaking on behalf of the Financial Reporting Council, but instead speaking as an academic specialist in the area of climate finance and climate scenario analysis. So if we start just thinking about these two targets, the two degrees target on climate change and pursuing efforts towards 1.5 degrees Celsius. Well, one key impact that I want to focus on is the coordinating efforts, is how they coordinate efforts, how they coordinate a whole range of different action across nations, across industries, and across the globe. And a key point here is that the United Nations does not sit at the top of some sort of global hierarchy telling everybody what to do, but instead, it establishes these targets of what everybody wants to achieve, what everybody wants the future to look like, limiting warming to below two degrees Celsius and pursuing efforts to limit it further towards 1.5 degrees Celsius. So what does that do? What do I mean when I say something is being coordinated here? Well, well, what I mean is that industry by industry and nation by nation, we're focusing on understanding what two degrees, 1.5 degrees means to us. And how do we get from today to a future where those targets have been achieved. So you'll hear lots of talk about scenarios and roadmaps at the moment. And that's precisely central to this, taking those long-term targets and making sure that we know the steps that we have to take now and in the future to get to make sure those targets become a reality. But let's just pause and think about this for a second. What does two degrees Celsius and 1.5 degrees Celsius really mean to you? Well, on the one hand, it means that there is an inevitable policy response to this. It means it's inevitable that climate policies and climate regulations will come online and be stronger and stronger as the years go by. So we don't know what they necessarily look like, but we know there will be strong regulatory action to do with achieving those targets. We also know that they imply a degree of physical impacts from climate change. And we've seen this already for years, that these dramatic climate events getting more and more uh, severe. This is a trend that's going to continue as well. So we might know that, but, but in a way, what if we want to understand this on a more granular level? Instead of that high level, there, will, there is an inevitable policy response and there will be greater physical impacts of climate change. What if we want to get more granular? What if we want to understand which policies are going to come online and when? What if we want to understand which technologies are going to be fundamental to every industry's transition to net zero and when those technologies will be coming online as well? Well, this is what we do. We take those two degrees, that two degrees target and 1.5 degrees target, and we develop a scenario or a roadmap to set out what we have to do today and what we have to do year by year to make sure we are hitting those targets to make sure the actions we're taking today and next year are all in line with achieving those targets. So what does this mean for financial regulation? Well, what it means is that a fundamental theme, if you like, a fundamental direction of travel is that financial regulation will create ever stronger links 
between those two targets, two degrees Celsius and 1.5 degrees Celsius, and the actions that we take today. It might not explicitly be for that reason, but if you think about the climate risk debate that's gained such traction over the last 10 years, it's fundamentally based on a carbon constrained future implied by the two degrees target on climate change. That's where the whole debate began. So in this, in this regard, it's the fundamental direction of travel in financial regulation is linking those future targets to what we do today for a whole range of different reasons and through a whole range of different mechanisms. Now, I've been accused of being optimistic on this before. So let me say, if it does sound optimistic, we've done this before. And we've seen this with Moore's law in the semiconductor industry. Moore's law that says we can achieve a doubling of processing power for the same cost every two years. Well, that was a prediction of the future, but also it became a target that had to be achieved. Coordinating efforts across the semiconductor industry and its key stakeholders so that research groups, the manufacturers, government agencies, all these groups would focus on achieving Moore's law. So it wasn't a prediction. It was a fundamental guide to investment decisions in the end. And how did that happen? Well, if you wanted to be part of the future of the semiconductor industry, you had to align what you did with Moore's law. So Moore's law was converted into technology roadmaps. What did technologies have to be capable of year by year? The short-term targets that people would have to hit to remain in line with those roadmaps. And cost was a key part of Moore's law. The cost of ownership calculations around each of these technologies. And what this vast complex calculative infrastructure did is it made sure everybody was aligned with making Moore's law a reality. There's a fantastic paper on this in Accounting Organizations and Society by Peter Miller and Ted Leary in 2007. The core concept they use is mediating instruments. But what I want to bring this back to is climate change. So this is not just optimism. This is what we have seen in the past with complex issues with many actors involved. So climate scenario analysis, this idea that we need to create bridges between long-term targets and what we do today, is here to stay. This idea that what we do today in, in finance is going to have to be linked to this future of climate change is going to be fundamental to the regulatory agenda in decades to come. So really, climate scenario analysis is a technique that is designed to help us make sense of how we can start hitting those long-term climate targets today. And really, what that means is you're going to find across the financial world, and as climate scenario analysis moves to the non-finance area as well, you'll find companies from across, say, the FTSE 350 that we're looking at, grappling with how do we align our strategies with those scenarios for the future of climate change? And how do we make sure we are resilient during the transition to net zero? We're at a point in history where everybody's making sense of this at the moment. Everyone's, some people already have, some people are way ahead, but other groups are now very much starting to make sense of how to make sure their strategies are resilient to this net zero transition. And climate scenario analysis is a key component in that. Because what it makes sure is that we know the future that we want to achieve, but what these techniques are doing and what these new regulations are doing is really making sure that everybody's focused on how to make that future a reality. And the efforts to make that future reality start today. So I'd just like to say thank you again to the organizers of this conference. I'm looking forward to the discussion that follows this. And if you want to reach out to me to follow up on any of these specific points, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn or Twitter as well. But thank you all. And I hope you enjoy the rest of this week and the rest of the conference.